and change is coming whether you like it or not. Look at these MPs voting. Those are conservative MPs. Can you recognize some of them? From places like Ontario and Quebec, sure, but also from places like BC and Alberta and Saskatchewan. They're all standing and voting for a motion sponsored by a Liberal MP named Bardish Chagger. And let me read you the text of the motion. Here's a hint. The motion, as you saw on the screen there, was called Paris Agreement. Ready? In the opinion of the House, climate change is a global problem that requires a global solution. And that despite the withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Agreement, Canada remains committed to the implementation of the agreement as it is in the best interests of all Canadians. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? For more than 30 years, the science has been crystal clear. How dare you continue to look away and come here saying that you're doing enough when the politics and solutions needed are still nowhere in sight. You say you hear us and that you understand the urgency. But no matter how sad and angry I am, I do not want to believe that. Because if you really understood the situation and still kept on failing to act, then you would be evil, and that I refuse to believe. The popular idea of cutting our emissions in half in 10 years only gives us a 50% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees and the risk of setting off irreversible chain reactions beyond human control. 50% may be acceptable to you, but those numbers do not include tipping points, most feedback loops, additional warming hidden by toxic air pollution or the aspects of equity and climate justice. They also rely on my generation sucking hundreds of billions of tons of your CO2 out of the air with technologies that barely exist. So a 50% risk is simply not acceptable to us, we who have to live with the consequences. How dare you pretend that this can be sold with just business as usual and some technical solutions? With today's emissions levels, that remaining CO2 budget will be entirely gone within less than eight and a half years. There will not be any solutions or plans presented in line with these figures here today because these numbers are too uncomfortable and you are still not mature enough to tell it like it is. You are failing us. But the young people are starting to understand your betrayal. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. And if you choose to fail us, I say, we will never forgive you. We will not let you get away with this. Right here, right now, is where we draw the line. The world is waking up. And change is coming, whether you like it or not. Thank you. Someone call 911, my, my mind was just violated. I've just been mentally raped. What they are doing is illegal 
There is a court injunction, yet for whatever reason, the law isn't being applied here. How you doing, guys? I'm good. I, I'm, good. I, I'm David Menzies, Rebel News, and uh, I guess you guys are observing things. I just had a quick question. Evidently, what they're doing is illegal, and there's an injunction against them. And I, I guess I'm just trying to find out, for the record, uh, why uh, the rule of law isn't being applied here, officer. Sorry, sir. We can't. We can't really comment we as can't. to what's going on right now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're not in a position to make a comment. Okay, then. It's pretty camera shy here. Maybe it's because they are indeed breaking the law. In the meantime, you have to wonder how long this is going to be allowed to continue. Uh, as I said, it is against the law. There is an injunction against these protests, but law enforcement is not enforcing the law. And maybe it stems from a complete lack of leadership. There is now a clear playbook for radical activists to follow. And they know that the prime minister will do literally nothing as the economy is brought to its knees. So knowing that there are future projects that may be proposed, what will the prime minister do differently in the future to prevent the types of layoffs and economic damage that these radical activists have caused? His very first question, sentence in that question, he demonstrated that uh, the leader of the opposition does not understand anything about reconciliation. The Prime Minister was willing to break the law, bend the rules, and even fired his Attorney General when he was trying to do a favour for his corporate friends at SNC-Lavalin. But when thousands of energy sector jobs are at stake, and when dozens of First Nations communities will benefit from these energy projects, the Prime Minister does literally nothing. So why is it that when it comes to his corporate crony insider friends, the Prime Minister is willing to break the law, but when it comes to providing hope and opportunity to thousands oh, of Canadians, the Prime Minister refuses to uphold the law. The Prime Minister lets radical activists shut down the rail network and anti-energy activists write All his money, government policies. The market certainly gets the message. Oil and gas projects are being built all over the world right now just not in Canada do you understand what's happening yet I hope so it was not a market failure or a failure of Canadian citizens it was a governmental failure that led us here a million masks supposed to be rated to the k95 standard for respirators respirators sorry uh, arrived in Canada and were found to be uh, not up to the standard needed for health care workers is that the total number of masks, defective masks, are there more? Have you found other equipment that's coming from China that's defective? Look, we know there'll be challenges when we procure from abroad. That's why we're building strong domestic capacity. One such example is Medicom, a company that we invested in to help scale up their facilities right here in Montreal for N95 masks and surgical masks as well. So we're building up strong domestic capacity, mobilizing industry to make sure we have made in Canada solutions that will protect Canadian frontline health care workers. I take your point on that, Minister, but that domestic effort, while vigorous, is going to take a lot of time, which is something that your government has pointed out. It will take some time. In the meantime, you are procuring a significant portion of PPE from China. How much more of it, beyond these one million masks, is defective? Look, I can tell you right now, we're going to have challenges from uh, procuring items from around the world, and there's going to be challenges with respect to the quality. But what I'm also saying is that because the domestic capacity that we're building up, in which in many cases the delivery is happening in days, not weeks, and so we're building up that capacity to offset some of those challenges that we will encounter. That fellow there is Navdeep Bain. Yeah, I guess, I guess that sounds legit. I guess that makes sense. If you're a frickin' turnip, that's about the only way you can believe that crap. Trudeau, Justin Trudeau. Um, that, I just shake my head at that. Okay. Oh, v man who capitalized without virtue on the name of his father. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes, wow is right. Wow. If he had an ounce of character, he would have never run. He's not, not an impressive person in my estimation. The Trudeau government, beyond parity at this point, is taxing the importation of medical equipment. Yes, you heard that right. N95 masks that were coming into Canada are being taxed by the Trudeau government. And on top of that, they're requiring that you have a license to import this. This unprecedented situation calls for unprecedented action. And it calls for good faith and trust between everyone involved. 
MPs are going to take a pay hike at the same time as they take more money from your pocket. That's right. If you haven't heard yet, in the middle of this pandemic, this health emergency that has become a an economic crisis for so many Canadians, MPs are not only going to increase the carbon tax from $20 a ton to $30 a ton, that's right, a 50% increase in the carbon tax, they're going to take a pay hike at the same time. At a time when many Canadians, more than a million, have applied for EI in the last two weeks, some estimates say as many as 1.6 million have applied for EI or the emergency benefits since they were announced. Well, in the middle of all that, MPs are saying, you know what, we need a little bit more money. Not only from you in terms of what you pay for things through the carbon tax, but we need more cash in our genes. And if you ask me, it all seems a little bit tone deaf. Now, this is happening because... MPs long ago, back in the days of Paul Martin and his minority Liberal government, decided they didn't like the bad headlines that came from members of Parliament voting a raise for themselves. It always was mm, unseemly. It never got good headlines. It always looked bad. So they passed one piece of legislation that said they'd get a raise every April 1st. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be great if we could just legislate ourselves a raise and never have to worry about it? The average MP salary right now is $178,000. They're going to go up to about $181,000, and the Prime Minister will be double that. So, should this be put on pause? I would think so. But when I put the question to the Prime Minister, he actually seemed surprised to find out that he was even getting a raise and said, well, maybe we'll talk about it now. Uh, in regards to, to salaries, I haven't heard uh, the Parliament of Canada having those discussions, but uh, I'm sure they will uh, reflect on it now that you've asked the question. So uh, it would seem that Canada has a lot of fake news also, eh? The CBC, which is the Canada Broadcasting Company, which confirms that, uh, yeah, we have some fake news out here also, eh? There are different types of fake news and there are different tiers of fake news. You have your fake news, which is overtly false information. And then you have your fake news, which is just fake news because it's not newsworthy stories to begin with. And then you can have your combination of fake news, which includes fake news that is factually incorrect with information that is in fact actually correct, but just absolutely not newsworthy. Another combination, which I just discovered today, is having a story that is in fact factually correct but totally unnewsworthy with a headline that is so grossly misleading that unless you read the story you would come away thinking something that is in fact factually incorrect folks just to show you how horrible it is it's not just the mainstream media party if you will uh, that is guilty of well in the case of justin trudeau never asking the tough questions you want them to ask but our very own Sheila gunn Reid a couple of days ago had a superb commentary that the junior media party, that would be CBC Kids, um, well, you know, going by the communist uh, manifesto of get them young, get them forever, they had the prime minister on their show, CBC Kids that is, and um, let's see what kind of uh, PR the young ones were dished out courtesy of the state broadcaster and our Prime Minister. My name is Gwyneth Scholar and I am eight years old from Maple, Ontario. And I would like to know, how is your family keeping busy while social distancing? Thank you. Well, thanks Gwyneth for your question. Obviously, it's uh, a difficult time for all families right now. Uh, from doing uh, lots of homework uh, on uh, on computer and keeping up with school works to uh, trying to you know play different games and keep busy throughout the long days with brothers and sisters without uh, without being able to talk to uh, or see friends, uh, talking a lot on the phone and over FaceTime. You know, kids are trying to find different ways to to get through days uh, when we we are all stuck at home where we're not able to go out and see our friends we're not able to do the things that we usually like to do uh, but we're really holding together as as families in Canada and that's a really good thing I am seeing that the pandemic has caused a reduction in pollution what will the government of Canada do to protect the quality of air when the economy starts up again uh, that's a really great question. Uh, we know that we have to protect the environment. We have to make sure we're fighting climate change uh, every single day. Uh, during this time of, of pandemic, of crisis, there's less economic activity, so there is less pollution. There is no question that there will be a challenge to the coming administration in the arena of infectious diseases, both chronic infectious diseases in the sense of already ongoing disease, and we have certainly a large burden of that, but also there will be a surprise outbreak, but also there will be a surprise outbreak, but also there will be a surprise outbreak. 
So for those who think that infectious diseases is gone, there's so many people who've made foolhardy statements not knowing at the time that they made them. And the mistake that so many people have made is something that several of our panelists have already referred to. And that is a failure to look beyond our own borders in the issue of the globality of health issues. Not only things that are there that will come here, but surprises that we have, but surprises that we have. When I think about infectious diseases, I break it down into a few buckets. The established infectious diseases that we know, and when I say I know, we mean that you could reasonably predict today what the disease burden of morbidity and mortality... Something's going on much bigger than this virus. Did any member of the cabinet see that intelligence from our military, yes or no? As I have said, Mr. Speaker, it, our intelligence sharing is very important. The Honorable Member for Carleton. The question was and is, did any member of the cabinet see that military intelligence, yes or no? The Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, part of the basis on which we are able to work closely with our partners, including when it comes to sharing intelligence, is sharing with Canadians only what we are able to do. Carlton. We know that the intelligence exists, and we know that the uh, military warned the government of the dangers of the coronavirus in early January. After January 22nd, how many people did this government allow into Canada from the Hubei province, the province from which the virus originated? How many? Honorable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to border controls, our government is very aware of the importance of ensuring that people coming into the country today are subject to mandatory quarantine. Do you envision that we're going to have multiple waves of shutdowns, lockdowns, closures of the economy, and how can we handle uh, those kinds of constant shutdowns? I think even after we're through this first wave, uh, we will need to remain vigilant and we will need to bring in different measures. Uh, normality, as it was before, uh, will not come back full on until we get a vaccine for this. And as you say, that uh, could be a very long way off. Yeah, I guess, I guess that sounds legit. I guess that makes sense. If you're a freaking turnip, that's about the only way you can believe that crap. People are sick, but they don't have to stay sick. They are killing them. They are not helping them. She used the word murder, coming from a nurse who went to New York City expecting to help. Patients are left to rot and die. Her words. She has never seen so much neglect. No one cares. They are cold and they don't care anymore. It's the blind leading the blind. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was on with some nurse friends of mine and we were discussing different medications that could be used to potentially help people. Doctors who were reporting around the country that they were using a combination of medications that were helping people. People were not dying when they were on these medications. They were getting better. Those medications are not being used in hospitals in New York City. What is happening is that they're putting people on nasal cannula. If they require more than six liters of nasal cannula, they get intubated, they go on the vent, or they get trached if there's not enough vents. They don't get high flow, no non-rebreather, no non-invasive ventilation, no CPAP, no BiPAP. They're on a closed system, the ventilator, versus a CPAP or a BiPAP for fear that it will spread the virus. Which, by the way, I know a nurse in Florida who was fired for exposing that about CPAP and BiPAP and patients being put on the ventilator, like straight away to the ventilator, to be on a closed system. The patients don't know any better. They don't have family with them. There is no one there with them to advocate for them. So they are scared and they give consent. The ventilators have high peep, high pressure, which then causes barotrauma. It causes trauma to the lungs. Dr. Uh, Sidel, Cameron Kyle Sidel, a few weeks ago, put out a video. He's in New York City, 
and he put out a video saying something is not right, like we're not treating this correctly. We're doing something wrong. This doesn't make sense. It's time to ask pertinent questions of your public officials, and it's time to ask who the entire Canadian government is working for. No hospitals are in a war zone condition. It just doesn't make sense. What we hear is not the same as what we see. Farmers are going bankrupt because they can't sell their product. How, what the hell? What the hell is going on? And these, again, Rob Ford's at the screen right now. These asshole politicians aren't saying anything worthy. They're not addressing the situation. They're not getting down. How could a politician allow milk to be dumped? I mean, even if you give it away free to all the people that are hurting and suffering, give it away. Don't dump it. It's food. Food for people. Jesus Christ. And nobody is upset about it. Except maybe me. I'm losing it, man. I am losing it. I'd love to see the Prime Minister's little cabin get circled by 10, 20, 50,000 people chanting 24 hours a day, drowning that little shit out, making him do something rather than just come out for his little 45-minute talk to the media and his little five-minute speech. Oh, we're all together. We're all going to make it through this. Oh, 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 yes, yes, we all have to. It, it is fair to say things won't go back to truly normal until we have a vaccine that we've gotten out to basically the entire world. Uh, and there will be people in this country that um, will try to continue pushing agendas that, again, run contrary to the will of most Canadians. But it won't be remembered as a dictatorship. But it kind of is like a dictatorship in a way, right? Because if 199 of the writings of 338 are based in Ontario and Quebec, if I'm not mistaken, there's 100 in Ontario and 99 in Quebec. And if they can vote these guys in constantly, repeatedly, over and over again, with election returns coming in before Albertans and Saskatchewanites and people in BC, whatever the case may be, and other people in Manitoba. Let's not forget about Man Manitoba. So if these people don't really have much of a say before Ontario and Quebec sort of throws its, cast their lots, well, where does that really leave us in this country? It doesn't leave us in a real democratic situation. You see in Australia, in, in Australia, if you don't like your prime minister, just chuck him out. They chuck him out. They chuck them out and they, that's the end of the story. Um, they, don't, they don't wait. Why can't we do that here in Canada? Why are we stuck with this guy for so long? Is he like a Castro? Probably because he's actually the son. Well, let's not go there. So I don't know. Is it a dictatorship or not? You know, we always ask that question. We can say sort of in, in jest, in the comments, in a fit of pique, or you know, in a bit of a rage, or just kind of humorously as we do, comedically on this vlog, you know, we'll say things about the boy whimper, what, what have you. But, it's kind of like that, because we can't get rid of this guy, neither electorally, nor non-confidently, and the bulk of the population, for some reason, manages to think that it's all tickety-boo. That's even scarier than living in a real dictatorship. This thing in Canada, I don't know what to call it, but it's damn scary. Do you understand what's happening yet? I hope so.